Church, it is a, a joy and an honor to uh, preach God's Word and allow God's Word to do a work in us so God can do a work through us uh, for His glory. The text that has been chosen today, God put this on my heart just so that I can uh, say something I believe to the church that the church needs, not just our church, I think the church worldwide needs. And that is five admonitions to the church that I will allow from God's Word to uh, bring to us today. And I know that we need it. It has been quite a year, has it not? Um, a year ago, we were ending 2019, entering 2020, but no one really knew what was coming. COVID-19 was beginning to surface Two or three months in, it hit us, and it began to create havoc, unrest, and fear. I looked this morning at the statistics, and as of this morning, 332,000 people have lost their lives in America due to COVID-19. This COVID-19 threw us into a worldwide lockdown, something I don't think that I could have ever imagined would have happened, but yet... It did shut down travel, shut down economies, shut down nations. It resulted in a sheltering in place many of us have never gone through before. It thrust us into disagreement on how to proceed. Do you wear a mask or do you not wear a mask? How far do you stay apart? How often should you wash your hands? Should you go out in public or should you not? Economic unrest erupted. For many, cities faced wild violence, if you recall. This past year, there's been a frantic search for a vaccine, which we now have. When you think about the weather we faced this last year, it's very interesting. We had raging wildfires, consuming floods, and a violent hurricane season that made its way all the way into the Greek alphabet. Never happened before. 2020 also thrust us into political turmoil, revealing, like we've never seen before, that we are a nation divided, not united. And because of all these things that I've just mentioned, there is great fear and frustration about life as we know it. There's an unsettling feeling that many people have. And I want to say to you today, the church has not gone unaffected. All of these things have affected the church, some for good, some for bad. And the challenges of 2020 should make us a better church, a more dependent church, a church with vision to accomplish God's work. People need to hear the truth like never before. We do not need to remove ourselves, but we need to engage ourselves into the community that God has given us. We hold truth, we've experienced truth, we know truth, and we must share truth. So what is the church to do moving forward into 2021? Well, I believe the five admonitions from the text that Ben read just a moment ago give good direction to the church. And so I want to share those. You say, well, what's an admonition? An admonition is simply this. It is a loving but firm reminder, counsel, and warning. For some today, it'll be a reminder. Reminders are good. I need them all the time. They go off on my phone or, you know, I have those who say, hey, you need to remember to do this. Reminders are great things. And if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this reminder is something we all need. How about counsel? Some good counsel. Good counsel is always needed. In God's Word, there's no better place to get good counsel than from him. And what about a loving and firm warning? That's good too. That has great, that's got great value. I'll take that. Now, I do want to say, you may be here today, you may be watching our live stream. There is a real factor for those who have compromised um, health conditions. They're not able. It's not wise to join in a larger group even with the protective measures. And that's fully understandable. But the church as a whole, even those who have to, in essence, shelter in place, 
We need to figure out how do we move forward. I've been asking the Lord to show us how, to give us creative ways to understand who we are and how to move forward. And that's what part of this message is all about, both for those who are gathered here in this church building today and those who are watching the live stream. We are still one together moving forward. I'm thankful for a vaccine that will uh, help some return to a more normal stage of life. That may be coming soon. But here's the thing. That may come and something else may happen. We don't know. That's life. But whatever it is that we will face as a church, I want us to face it with great confidence, with vision, to make a difference for Jesus Christ. If He's left us here, it's for a purpose. If He's left us here, it's to proclaim truth. And we've got to know how to do that. So I think the church is in great need of these admonitions. I think all five of them have spoken to me as I've prepared this message, and I want them to speak to you. I've needed them, and I believe you need them. We will see that these admonitions are to those who are a new covenant people. And before we get into those, I want to just lay down some, some, some basic background to the text so the fullness of the text can come out to us. If you'll look there in the very first verse, verse 19, he says, Therefore, brothers... Those two little words are an indication that those are people who have received Christ as Savior. They are a new covenant people. And so in the language of the text that we're looking at, the writer of Hebrews is is going back and forth between an, an old covenant understanding that has led to the new covenant. And there were those who had believed who were going back to the old covenant and not living in the new covenant. Let me explain a little bit about the Old Covenant before we get started in the New Covenant. If you were born a Hebrew by birth, it meant you entered into a world of the Old Testament ritual, the Old Covenant. These people, they knew the Torah, they read the prophets, they kept the Sabbath day holy, they followed dietary laws, they sang hymns uh, from the Psalms, they observed feast days, they were faithful to tithe. Through and through they were Jewish, tied to the Old Covenant. But those, therefore, brothers, the new covenant, those who believed in Christ as Savior, as spoken of in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament, received in a changed life that Jesus was the Savior of the world. Those, they were the ones he's speaking of in regards to the new covenant. Uh, They knew and they believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah as recorded in the Old Testament. But there was this tension for those who had believed in Jesus to return to the old. So if you believed in your new covenant here, old covenant was constantly saying, hey, come back to old covenant practices. Come back to the synagogue. Come back to where you came from. Stop believing and professing that Jesus was the Savior. So there was this tension. There was this draw to return to a former way of life. And the writer of Hebrews is addressing that. And the same pressure that they felt in that day and time, we feel as well. I think it's a a spiritual thing that we go through. We face pressure to return to a former way of life. Whatever that may be for you, it's probably different for the person beside you to the person across from you. It's just different. But there's a former way of life that the flesh wants to go back to. We want to revert back. But the writer here is saying, don't go back. Go forwards. Not backwards, but forwards. And that's why these five admonitions are needed. I need them. You need them. We all need them. We need to hear these words. And I'm praying God uses them in an incredible way in our lives today. So let's take a look at these five. The first is simply this. We must embrace our confidence. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, would you just slip your hand up to say, I, I, my life has been changed. I am a believer. I, I am his child. If that's you, these words are for you. And you have a confidence. I have a confidence. Watch this, 19, 20, and 21. He says, therefore, brothers, those are the new covenant people, those who believe in Christ. Since we have confidence 
to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, we've got to grasp this confidence that we have. This is language in the Old, Test, Old, the Old Covenant that now is understood with the New Covenant in what Jesus did when he gave his life and sacrificed. This is a confidence we have in knowing and going to God in and through Jesus that the new believer, the new covenant, the new life, the new way has. If we were to try to understand the old covenant imagery that is given here, we would understand that God's presence was in the most holy of holies in the temple. And there was a curtain that was a barrier between this area and other areas. And the high priest entered the holy of holies once a year. There was all types of preparation to purify yourself, prepare yourself. And they would go in once a year. But now there is this new covenant imagery that speaks about Jesus' body representing the curtain. This heavy curtain that divided the Holy of Holies from other areas. That curtain is representative of Jesus dying on the cross. Okay? You got to grasp this. His body was torn at his death. It's very beautiful. I, I love how it's put in Matthew 27, 50 and 51. And then I love the response of the soldier, the centurion in 54. But let me read 50 and 51 so we can grasp what it's talking about here. This is the recording of Jesus' death on the cross and it says, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And many people believe God did this from the top to the bottom. It wasn't from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom, the curtain was torn. Other things happened. The rocks split open. Those and the grave came out. All of these things happened. And it says in 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. It was evident. But Jesus' death gave believers access to God. That's what's so important here. The, the curtain was torn. And through Jesus, we have access to God. That's why we believe in the priesthood of the believer. We don't depend on the priest to go in for us. We don't believe on an, uh, in an earthly priest that we must go to today to have access to God. We believe in the priesthood of the believer so that the believer with the Holy Spirit in us, with the Word of God as our basis, we have access to God through Jesus and what He did on the cross. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It must be understood. His flesh, the body, was torn on the cross his life sacrifice, that is the blood that was given. And God tore the veil in the temple symbolizing that what Jesus had done on the cross, this new and living way, opened the way for all humanity to come to God. This was the new and living way. This, was, this is the only way, Jesus. Didn't he say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This is our confidence. This is my confidence. It's your confidence. Jesus' sacrifice makes him the great priest, listen, over the house of God, meaning Jesus is over you. He's over me. He's over us, the body of Christ. He, we were bought with a price, right? The blood of Jesus. Old covenant was once a year. New covenant means that we dwell in the presence of God every day, all day, consistently. Do you understand that? And since all of this is true, it is a factual basis to call the church to the next four admonitions. But if we don't understand this admonition, that we have this confidence, this incredible 
unbelievable confidence in Jesus, the rest makes no sense at all. But the first is to embrace our confidence, to understand it, live in it. And if so, once we have, we can move to the second, which is simply this. First, we must embrace our confidence. Then secondly, we must draw near to God. Look at 22. He says this, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near to God. We do this out of our confidence and understanding that Jesus is the living way, the great high priest over the house of God. And we can do this with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith, because we've allowed Jesus to cleanse us and wash us, and we're pure through him. So the believer is called to this action. Each of you who raised your hand, each of you know, that know you have this confidence, you have a responsibility. You know what it is? You have a responsibility to draw near to God. You say, well, I can't get to him. Yes, you can through Jesus. You say, are you sure? Absolutely sure. Positive. And we're to draw near. What does it mean? It means we're to seek God. The Bible says that clearly. I'm, I'm, I'm to seek God through his word. I am to listen to God, and I am to obey God. Seek, listen, and obey. And the real question is, how are we doing in this arena? Do we live our days and never give God any concern? Do we really seek to know Him, understand Him, want to be a part of His activity? These are very basic questions. But listen, if we're not drawing near to God, how can we hear from God? How can we obey God if we're not in His presence? I think people complicate this drawing near to God thing. We complicate it. We think we've got to be in a certain uh, building, or we've got to be in a certain mood, or we've got to do it a certain way. Now, there is some importance in coming with a pure heart, an honest heart, yes, but drawing near to God. Listen, when I want to spend time with my wife, I draw near to her. We may eat dinner together and sit there and talk. We may get up in the morning and and sit and talk, or in the evening, sit on the couch and talk. But, but for me to hear her heart, for me to understand what's going on in her life, it's very simple. i got to be with her, right? I've got to make a connection. And see, I, I think that people are overcomplicating this thing. We, we go throughout the day, we never give God a thought, we never spend time with Him, we never open His Word, we've been convinced it's more than we can understand, we've been convinced that it's not applicable to today, we've been convinced that I'll just go to church, but I don't have to do it day by day, we've been convinced that, that this, this is, you know, we don't want to take it too far. Whatever, whatever it is that has brought us to the point that we're not purposefully Desiring in our hearts to draw close to God, something is wrong. Either we do not know Him, we do not possess the confidence in Jesus to come to Him, or we just don't care. But we should care. To draw close to Almighty God? Is there anything greater? Oh my. I'm telling you, if we do not draw close to God, we will lose hope and perspective. There are times when I get discouraged. And I want to ask you, do you feel like this? Something comes into your life and you can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. It isn't good. It just unsettles you. Come on now. Don't we all feel that way about things? It could be relationships. It could be about the future. It could be about uh, something you're doing. I don't know. But it unsettles you, right? Whatever unsettles you. My question is, is it greater than God? Is it greater than something God can handle? Is it greater than, than, than the God of the universe that has sovereignty over our lives as we trust Him? Listen, the answer is there's nothing. There's nothing that God won't allow that He won't take us through. So the real question for me has always been, do I have God's perspective? Can I see it as He sees it? Can I trust Him fully? Can I live by faith, not by fear? And to do that, here's what I have to do. When those feelings come over me, when that inability for me to see the way forward, I've got to draw close to God. 
And I'm not going to overcomplicate it. I'm just telling you I'm not going to do that. I get my Bible. I find me a quiet place. I open my Bible, and I begin to talk to God, and I let God talk to me, and I put it out there as real as I know how to pull it, put it out there, and as honest as I can, and I'll tell God I need perspective. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I need to hear from you. And I let God speak to me. And it may not be immediate, but my heart's open, and I, and I begin to read His Word, and I look for principles and promises and the Holy Spirit to work. And when He does... And he always does. He gives me just what I need. Maybe not the full answer, not the whole picture, but he gives me what I need. It brings peace to my heart because I've drawn close to God. Try it. Go ahead, try it. The Holy Spirit's in you. His word is true. God is waiting. Jesus has made the way. Try it. That's how I get perspective. That's how I get perspective. But if I fail to draw close, and I'm feeling this unsettled feeling, and I don't draw close, let me tell you what happens. It gets more and more. It overwhelms me more and more. I get more fearful and frightful, and I get more controlling, and I, and I want to be the one taking the lead. I want to do something about it. I want to solve the problem. That's what men do. They solve problems. And it usually just gets worse because I've not drawn close to God and I don't have his perspective and I lose hope and perspective. But if I draw close, like he says here, let us draw near to God, something incredible happens. And then I want you to see the third admonition is this, is that we must hold on to hope, verse 23. And once we draw close, this can happen. He said, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. See, obviously what is going on here in this day and time is that there were some who were forsaking their confession of Jesus Christ and returning to the Old Covenant. Remember I explained that to you early on? The Old Covenant people probably were putting pressure on the New Covenant people to come back, stop believing in Jesus, stop professing in His name. This isn't working. Come back to the traditions. Follow your heritage. And there was this pressure. And some obviously went back to their former way of life and how easy it is to do that when we're not drawing close through Jesus to Almighty God. We easily go back to our former way of life. No longer are we holding unswervingly to the hope we profess, the confession in Jesus Christ. No longer are we telling other people that we are a child of God through Jesus. No longer are we telling people God's love story through Jesus because somehow, some way, we've lost our heart for that. We've lost our profession of that. Now, if somebody really pushes us and says, do you believe in God? Are you going to heaven? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you ever been baptized? We can pull up a story. But it's not naturally what's flowing from our heart. We've lost that, that love that brings this consistent desire to profess Jesus Christ. And that's what we need. But don't abandon your profession of Jesus Christ. Hold swer unswervingly to that. Don't let anybody steal that from you. See, I really believe that is a great definition of experiencing personal revival when God is so rich in your life. You just have to talk about it. It just overflows. But for those who have deserted, who are no longer drawing near, they have moved away from. They have, they're not holding on to this profession that brings hope. We can hold on to hope, and we must hold on to hope. And here's the confidence that we have, because God has promised. You see that? God has promised and is faithful. It's not... It's not me in my strength doing it. It's in the surrender that I find the promise and the faithfulness of God to do what He's asked me to do. See, it's in the surrender that the strength comes, in His faithfulness and in His promises. So I want to say to you, let's not abandon our faith. Let's take hold of our faith and live it to the fullest. Oftentimes, if you'll turn over to Hebrews 12, go just a couple of chapters and let me... Read a little bit of this to you. You know, oftentimes when I get discouraged, I, I turn here. Hebrews 12, the first few verses. 
the first three specifically. And maybe you're familiar with them, but let me read them to you. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you know, oftentimes I'll think about those who've gone before me, who've passed away and are in heaven, and it's an encouragement to me to know I'm going to give an account one day, and to me that I'm called to be faithful until I go home. I like thinking about those people who've gone before me. I thought about my dad recently. Johnny was mentioning it to me just before the service. He said, I didn't realize your dad died on Christmas Day. He did. But it's a great reminder to me of one who has gone before me and his faithfulness and my need to be faithful and my need that today is going to come when I'm going to give an account. That's a good thing. Think about those, this great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance The race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on who? Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Yes. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that, Mark, you will not grow weary and lose heart. I grow weary. I lose heart. When I lose perspective, I'm not looking to Jesus as I should. Remembering, realizing that He is my way, the new and living way. I love that text. Warren Wiersbe said, when a believer has his hope fixed on Christ and relies on the faithfulness of God, then he will not waver. Isn't that true? Oh, man, it's true. I don't want to waver going into the new year. How about you? So we've seen we've got to embrace our confidence. We've got to draw near to God. We've got to hold on to hope. And then, listen, once you do that as an individual, you really understand the confidence. You're drawing near, right? You're professing faithfully. You're in a position to embrace and carry out the, two, the next two admonitions, and here they are. The first is this, we must spur one another on. But if we're not doing the others, we're probably not going to do this. In fact, no, we're not going to do this. Look at what he says. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Such a simple verse, but yet such a powerful verse, a needed verse, a command to those who are in Christ, the church, what to do to spur one another on. The word consider here means to fix the mind on. Consider. Listen, I want to say to you, going into the new year, I want you to, as a believer in Christ, to consider. It means to fix the mind on, like a radar locking on its target. I read an article just a few days ago, you may have seen it as well, where the army um, tested their new howitzer. It hit a target 43 miles away. On the nose, it said. 43 miles. Can you imagine shooting a round that hits its target 43 miles away? That's impressive. But see, it was fixed like a radar on a target. So the idea of focusing on something in order to produce a strategy for obtaining it is what we're talking about here. We are considering what strategy it will take how we're going to do it to spur one another on to love and good deeds. This word spur, it means to deliberately provoke. Uh, I want to deliberately provoke you to love. I want to deliberately provoke you to good deeds. Now I want you to think about that. If all of God's people are going around deliberately provoking other people to love, how powerful and beautiful is that? If all of God's people are going around and they are deliberately provoking other people to good deeds, can you imagine how powerful that is? See, love moves in the area of attitude and good deeds moves in the area of action. And when we encourage one another in this way, it's amazing how the church just It it, it just churns up in us who we are to be as we do this for one another. We got to get a plan that is to be specific. We got to carry it out. That means to take action. And then we impact each other as we impact the world for Christ. 
Here are some ideas. I mean, I'll just, let's just think about some together. Would you be willing to make yourself available if God puts somebody on your heart to go have a cup of coffee with them? And in so doing, as the Holy Spirit leads you with God's Word, would you provoke that person to love? Or if you got with them, would you say, let me tell you the latest gossip that's going on. Now, you wouldn't say it like that. You'd just kind of talk about some things. But see, there's a big difference. If you're provoking someone to love, you're helping stir up in them the truth of God, see, in their attitude. And if you're provoking them to good deeds, you may invite them to go with you to do something, some type or kind of ministry. You may encourage them to use their gifts this year in a way they've never thought about using them. I don't know how to answer all that. Maybe God puts somebody on your heart that you're to call and encourage that has not been in church. Or maybe someone who's unable to be because they have a pre-existing condition and they just can't risk being in the body of Christ. You know what they need? And many, you know what they need that are watching online? They need to hear from you. They need to get, get a phone call to say, how are you doing? Let me tell you something. We all experience moments and seasons of loneliness that's why the church should not separate, but gather. That's why we gather, because we need one another. We all have different gifts. We use them differently, but we're coming together so that we can encourage one another as we worship the Lord, so then we go out with great power to do His work. There is something valuable to interacting together as a church. And for those who are watching online, they may need to pick up the phone. They may need to call somebody else because God's put it on their heart to encourage someone else. Look, look it goes both ways. We're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to be led by the Lord. We're going to have to find our way through whatever comes in this new year. But in so doing, we can encourage one another. We can spur one another on to love. Now, is that a bad thing? If you're spurring somebody on to hate, that's not a good thing. You're spurring somebody else to live selfishly, not a good thing. But if it is to love and good deeds, is there any other way to spend your time encouraging another believer in Jesus Christ? We need it. I need it from you, and you need to hear it from me. And I'm trying to give it to you today because we need this. The church needs it. So we must spur one another on. Yes. And then... The fifth, we must keep meeting together. Verse 25, look at what he says. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Obviously, there were those who were by habit consistently removing themselves from the fellowship of believers. It's not good. We cannot give up meeting together. We must find ways to do so. I got with my family, um, with my two sisters and their kids, I don't know, a week or so ago. And um, I hadn't been with them probably for over a year. And we, we met at my sister's son's house. And we went upstairs. They, they got a new house. They were showing us their house. And uh, I'd been giving him a hard time. When they came for the wedding, uh, Jared and his wife came. And they said, we're having Christmas at our house. We'll look forward to seeing you. And I said, yeah, I can't wait to get there. When I see that new house of yours, I'm going to come in there, and I'm going to tear that place up. I was teasing him, of course. I said, I'm going to walk around with my shoes on with mud on them. I'm going to open the windows, cut the heat on. I'm going to leave my trash everywhere. I was just teasing him, you know. But I always tease my kids. That's what I'm going to do when they get to their homes. But anyway, we got there, got to see their new house. It was beautiful. They walked us all around. Uh, we went upstairs to one room, and in one of the rooms, which I'm pretty illiterate on the, all this stuff, but there were literally thousands, as I understand it, thousands and thousands of dollars of Pokemon cards. I couldn't see the value, but he said it's there. I believe him. And I said, Jared, I said, I didn't know you collected Pokemon cards. He goes, oh, yeah, man, you know, he's telling me all about it. Now, how many of y'all in here collect Pokemon cards? Ah, 
There's about three people that understand this illustration. All right. Listen, that's not the point of the illustration. Here's the point. I didn't know that about him. Why? Because I hadn't been with him in over a year. I didn't know that. When we separate ourselves from one another, we separate and we don't know each other. We don't know the hurt that's going on. We don't know how to pray for one another. We don't even know how to encourage one another if we are not coming together. When families do not connect, they disconnect. It's just a natural thing. And so for us to connect is super important. It is part of God's plan. We need each other. We need to share where we are, where, what's going on, how we can pray for one another, how we can encourage one another, how we can spur one another on. There's something powerful about it. There's something powerful about someone meeting you, speaking to you. There's something powerful about in the ministry center connecting with someone and as the Lord leads, praying for one another. There's something about sitting in a class and, and having the word proclaimed and talking about it, how it shapes us. There's something about, I love our men's Wednesday night Bible study because we sit and we talk about God's word and there's something supernatural and spiritual going on, how we encourage one another and God's speaking and leading and it changes us and we go out and we live differently. But that group of men coming together, they are functioning as the body of Christ and it's a beautiful thing. It's a needed thing. It's a must. Because if we don't come together, we don't know each other. Coming together, meeting together, it grows us close, it encourages us, it challenges us. But if we don't, we create harmful habits. And harmful habits, these people were in a habit, harmful habits are pretty easy to create. Separation, ease, um, you know, do I get on the treadmill, do I not? We tend to say I'm not going to get on the treadmill, right, when it comes to exercise. Do I go run five miles or do I sit on the couch and watch TV? We'll always revert back to what's easier. And see, I think one of the great challenges that we faced this past year and we're going to face into the new year is there are some things that are easier, whatever that may be for us, than coming together. But if we understand convictionally the value of coming together, we'll be encouraged to do so is my point. Some of you have yet to believe that your life can impact another or that you are open to let somebody else's life impact you, but God is waiting to do this among us, this encouraging one another. Isn't it interesting to you? It is to me that in this portion of the text, this is really about not what we receive but what we give. Encouragement is to be given, not received. He's talking about this in the mode of giving. It means to inspire to continue on a chosen course. It means to literally impart it into someone's heart. The courage or boldness needed that I have the ability to impart into your heart what you need to take the next step in following Christ. I remember about a year ago, I picked up the phone and, and called a church member who was struggling. And God just put it on my heart to do it. And we're on the phone together, and I said, uh, uh, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm just lying in bed. It was probably about 10 o'clock. I said, why are you still lying in bed? I don't know. I'm just I'm struggling, having a hard day. I can't get perspective. Was able to say a few things, simply, you know, hey, it's time to get up. Do the next thing. Swing your legs over and put them on the floor. Get up. And we talked about some real basic things to do and why to do them. It wasn't rocket science. It was just the needed word of encouragement at that moment to get past the spiritual battle, to know somebody was praying, somebody cared, and the small steps mattered to get up and go forward. And they did. <laughs> the simple things. See, that in that moment, I, and I, I couldn't take credit for that in any way, but at that moment, encouragement took place over the phone that literally imparted into that person's heart the courage they needed to go forward. That's what we all need. I need it from time to time. I, actually, I need it every day. Be an encourager to someone. 
It is the fundamental to the Christian faith because we all need each other and we face hard times. Mark Twain said, I can live for a week off of one good compliment. You should find somebody to encourage, genuinely. Not manipulatively, but genuinely. We were in a restaurant, I don't know, about three weeks ago. And uh, the waitress came and got us some, we were at a Mexican restaurant, and got us some chips and drinks and whatever else. And Michelle commented to us, said, that, that waitress is really doing a good job. She came back through to see if we needed something else, and she looked up at her genuinely and said, you are doing such a good job. Thank you for being such a great waitress. And the lady just paused. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she said, do you mean that? And she said, yes. She goes, you've made my night. You really mean that. That was the word of encouragement she needed. That has nothing to do with being in the church and being a part of the church. That was just a general word of encourage, genuine encouragement. But as believers, we need that for one another, right? We do. I want to say to you, I want to encourage you, God has value for your life. Don't shrink back. Move forward. Don't think that you come to a point that you, there's nothing more that you can give to the church and you figured everything out. Listen, your very presence may be encouraging a younger believer to move forward. Your very presence of faithfulness has a voice of impact. Whether you come and you hear a lesson you heard 10 years ago or five minutes ago, it's being a part that makes the difference. Absentee fatherhood has killed the home, but fathers who are available, even though they don't say much, have incredible impact. Their stability, their presence, the consistency. And so some of us will believe, well, we don't have to go to church. We've been to church. We've done that. We don't have anything else to give. There's nowhere for me to serve. Let me tell you something. There's always something for someone, and the consistency factor speaks volume to the stability and encouragement that we all need from one another. Don't get into harmful habits. They're easily established. Oh, he throws this one in here. What does he say? And all the more as you see the day approaching. We should be watchful for the Lord's return. All the more means we should be motivated to be the church and be all God intends for us to be before Jesus returns. We can't be the church if we're not together. We'll be going, I didn't know you sold po Pokemon cards. The day is approaching. There's a future expectation of the certainty of Jesus' return. We should live with our eye to the sky. In Luke chapter 21, Luke gives the exhortation in verse 28 of chapter 21. He said, when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. What are these things? Ray Pritchard put it this way. He said, they are the great movements of men and nations that Jesus talked about. In the days leading up to our Lord's return, the world will be plunged into unprecedented turmoil. Take the unrest in the Middle East, multiply it by a factor of 100, and you have the situation Jesus is talking about. In Luke 21, 28, Jesus encourages his followers to examine the world for the signs of his return. Let me make that stronger. Jesus expects his followers to watch for his return. As I'm encouraging you and you're encouraging me, we have an eye to the sky knowing that the soon return of Jesus is going to happen. It is certain. And knowing that he's coming impacts how we function as believers. Great word. Great word. See, I just believe this with all my heart. When I help others, I help myself. What? Yeah. When I strengthen others, I strengthen myself. When I lift one, someone else's load, my load becomes lighter. What are you talking about? I'm talking about what the Bible says is to give is to receive. <laughs> That's what we're talking about when we talk about encouragement that comes out of this drawing. We got this confidence. We draw close. We profess and now we're doing this ministry with one another. It's beautiful. Just the other day, just a few days ago, right out here, 
I shared a bag of food with someone in need. A guy came across the road. He had a basket full of stuff. He called my name. Or he said, he didn't call my name. He said, you're the pastor, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, would you have any food that I could have? He said, I'm just so hungry. We talked for a few moments. I said, I'll go check and see what I can find. You wait right here. His name was Alex. I said, Alex, wait right here. So I made my way in to an area where we keep some food in bags to see if there were any still available. And I did. I found one. I walked back out. And when I walked back out, I began to talk. And as I began to talk to him, another person from our school, an administrator from our school, was walking down the sidewalk. And the three of us converged on the sidewalk. We were able to give this food to a man who said, oh, and I don't know, but I assume it's true that his wife had died earlier that day, and I think it is true from what I know about it. And we got to talk about the love of Jesus, where he's going to spend eternity. And we had a chance, the three of us, just to have a conversation because a small bag of food was provided for someone in need that lives on the streets. You say, why do I tell that story to you? Because I had a chance to talk about Jesus. That's professing my faith. And it all started with a small bag of food. Because someone in the church cared enough to provide the food, someone in the church cared enough to put the food into a small bag. And this would not be possible unless the church existed and people were involved in serving and giving. It would not even be possible for this to take place if we were not existent where we are in the ministry God has for us. It's only possible because the church was being the church. You say, well, I didn't know you gave that food. There's a lot of things that go on that the church does that most of us don't know that the other person does. I got a letter the other day in the mail from a, a man who's incarcerated talking about how much he enjoyed our music. Where's Daniel? He's in here somewhere. He enjoyed hearing Daniel and the others sing. He enjoyed the, the Word of God. And he didn't want anything. He wasn't asking for anything. He's simply sharing how much it had impacted his life as a believer as he's incarcerated. You didn't know that. Well, I'm sharing it with you now. Maybe that's an encouragement to you. But that's only possible because we're being the church. A bag of food, a message that goes out that encourages the testimony that we have for others, wherever God may lead us, all of it, all of it, food sharing, message giving, song singing, whatever it may be, is only possible because we are the church coming together. You say, I showed up today. I didn't give anybody food, but your being here is an encouragement to someone else who may have been that person who got the bag, who purchased the food, who put it together, that allowed me to pick it up, to take it out for the administrator from the school and myself to speak to this man and be an encouragement to him. You were a part of it. You don't know it, but you were. You don't think so, but you are. And there are other things that are happening that I don't specifically, I'm not a part of, but I am part of the church, and faithfulness in the whole deal brings it all together so we can be the church for His glory. This out of many other things, and there are so many we could talk about, uh, we do for His glory, and they're possible, and I want to run this in reverse if you'll give me a moment to do this. It won't take but about 30 seconds, but think about it this way. Those things are only possible if we do not this is backwards. I'm running the, the outline backwards. Are you ready? It's only possible if we do not give up meeting together. It's only possible if we are still spurring one another on to love and good deeds. It's only possible to do those two things if we are holding on to hope and professing Jesus. And that's only possible if we're still drawing near to God which is only possible because of our confidence that Jesus has made a way for us to have a relationship with God. As we enter 2021, let the church, like never before, be the church, no matter what may come.